So I'm curious how many people are familiar with deep sea mining? Raise of hands. Okay, great. So as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Grace Pevin. I'm a GIS and database technician for EXA Data and Mapping Services. And I'm, I'm going to be talking about a web-based geodatabase tool for seabed mineral exploration. So we are under contract with the International Seabed Authority to build a web application consisting of an underlying geodatabase to aid in resource management and regulatory decisions pertaining to deep sea mineral exploration and mining. Um, and then before I dive into the project, I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors, Peggy Meyer, who's here today. She's the founder of EXA and the senior scientist, and Dr. Sander Molsau, who is the uh, director of the Office of Environmental Management and Mineral Resources for the International Seabed Authority, so the source of our funding for this project. So the International Seabed Authority is an agency of the United Nations based in Kingston, Jamaica, and they, their job is to regulate the exploration and mining on the seafloor in international waters. So the need for a seafloor regulatory agency arose in 1982 out of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. And there are currently 168 member states um, signed onto the Law of the Sea, and it's interesting to note that you, the United States is not part of that. Um, so the rules dictate from the Law of the Sea that the ISA, or the International Seabed Authority, um, make licen licensing decisions um, so that a portion of all profits from mining in international waters uh, go towards benefiting developing states that don't have the financial means to mine on their own. Um, so that's one of their missions. Another is to study, protect, and preserve the marine environment. And they do this through no mining zones um, and environmental impact assessments. So the central question of our project is how do we manage data for three different metal types regulatory regimes, and oceanographic environments. So our web application and geodatabase is um, addressing all of these different challenges. So our key project components, we're building a geodatabase. We're in the process of building um, this whole web application and geodatabase. So our geodatabase um, is being built to facilitate management of both spatial and non-spatial data. Um, for these three different metal types, regi regulatory regimes and environments, um, and also a supporting web-based GIS tool is being developed, integrated with Esri APIs, um, such as Esri JavaScript, to aid the authority in making those um, environmental impact uh, decisions and regulatory decisions. Um, so they can conveniently query, analyze, and assess, assess those environmental impacts um, of seabed exploration and mining. Oh, and we are also creating standardized reporting templates uh, for the upload of data by contractors, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So there are currently 27 exploration contracts happening in international waters. Um, so the, thor the ISA um, has entered into 15-year contracts um, with these 27 different contractors, and these contractors apply for exploration rights um, in these specific areas. And the ISA, um, these contractors are either educational, academic institutions, government agencies, or private companies interested in these different minerals. Um, and they're also, in, within those exploration contracts, they're collecting baseline environmental data, uh, which will be publicly available, and then mineralogy data, which is confidential data. Um, that shows the economic value of those different mineral types. And it's important to note that mining has not yet occurred, and all of these regulations are still in development. So this is a map of uh, the exclusive economic zone, which a lot of us are probably familiar with. It's the uh, boundary between national and international jurisdiction throughout the world's oceans. And um, in those white circles, those are the different exploration contracts happening around the world right now. So there's a lot of environmental data associated with all of those little polygons. And um, the ISA refers to this area outside of national jurisdiction as the area. <laughs> so to understand our project, it's important to understand the flow of data throughout the whole system. So we have our, can't really see that. Um, we have our central data repository in the middle, or our geodatabase. And there's a lot of information flowing into this geodatabase. So we have historical data um, that has already been collected um, that's unstructured, so it doesn't really have a spatial component to it. Um, and that's going to be collected by our metadata catalog, which I'll mention later. Um, and then we also have our contractor templates, uh, which we're uh, building right now that are a standardized structure to fit into the database. 
and there's confidential data that the Legal and Technical Commission and the International Seabed Authority can view, and the Legal Technical Commission is a body part of the International Seabed Authority that creates regulations, assesses environmental impacts, and reviews exploration contracts. Um, and then that public data is just the environmental baseline data. So there are three unique oceanographic environments that drive the regulations and really our geodatabase and application design. So the first mineral to be contracted and explored was polymetallic nodules. Um, they're Economic interest is in their manganese, iron, silicates, and hydroxide makeup. They're found on the seafloor at depths between 4,000 and 6,000 meters, and there are currently 17 exploration contracts. And most of these contracts are happening in the clarion clipperton fracture zone in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and all those different colors are different contractors. So there's 17 different contractors within that area. And then we have one contract happening in the Indian Ocean. Our next mineral environment are polymetallic sulfides, and we actually got to see through the Nautilus Live uh, webcam yesterday an active sea vent, which is where these minerals can occur. So they're hydrothermal, hydrothermal mineral deposits, um, either on active or inactive sea vents. They mostly occur mid-ocean ridges at high temperatures with thriving chemosynthetic biological communities. And their economic uses are copper, zinc, lead, iron, silver, and gold. And there are currently six exploration contracts, and a lot of them are happening within the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, and I'll zoom in more on these later, uh, they're kind of hard to see up here. Uh, so you can see on that bathymetry layer, they really are distributed along those mid-ocean ridges. And our last mineral environment are cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts. These occur in areas of high volcanic activity um, at shallower depths between 400 and 5,000 meters, and they occur in the flanks and summits of seamounts throughout our world's oceans. And the economic use for them um, are cobalt, platinum, and rare earth elements. And the ISA has estimated that only a few of the 30,000 seamounts that are estimated to be throughout the Western Pacific Ocean have actually been sampled and mapped in detail. So there's some contracts in the Atlantic Ocean and in the Western Pacific Ocean. You can see all those seamounts dotted throughout the Western Pacific. So the three metal environments create the unique spatial regulations necessary to manage these different contract areas, and that really drives our geodatabase design. So this blue uh, rectangle here is a, kind of an abstract figure of a contract area, and each contract um, starts out as an exploration area, so there's a 15-year period for each metal type that um, is being explored within this um, particular contract area, um, collecting a lot of environmental and mineralogy baseline data. And over time, part of this uh, original contract area is relinquished, and it is reserved for developing states that don't have the mining technology or the means um, to be mining. So all those profits, um, actually a, develop, a developed state will be doing the mining for them, but those profits will go to the developing state. And then from the original contract area, um, that can be exploited or mined for those minerals of interest. And then there's this independent area called reference areas or areas of particular environmental interest. And these essentially act as a control to compare the environmental conditions um, from an area that's not being mined, the reference areas, to the area that is being mined, the exploited areas, just to compare those environmental impacts. So polymetallic nodules, um, on the map to the right, uh, this is one contract that I've picked out from the clarion clipperton zone. And you can see the polygons are contiguous or non-contiguous, uh, distributed out this contract area. And this is a figure given to me by the ISA. Um, and so it's kind of, there's a temporal component to these contract areas, and you can see how that the area size changes over time. So it starts out with a developed state having 150,000 square kilometers of exploration area. Half of that is given to, is reserved for a developing state that can later be explored and mined. And so over time, um, over 15 years of that exploration contract, uh, part of that is relinquished, and they, they're left with 10 to 30,000 square kilometers that can actually be mined 
Um, and that is over a 30 year period. And again, that has not occurred yet. And those regulations are still in development. Polymetallic sulfides is similar with the temporal component, um, but the spatial structure differs. So the contract area is split into what they call blocks, and there's 100 blocks per contract. And they can be, again, contiguous or non-contiguous. And each block is 10 square kilometers. So a similar um, structure here, so if exploration takes place over 15 years, and a developed state is giving half of their um, contract area to a developing state, and then part of that is relinquished, and eventually 2,500 square kilometers um, can be used for mining. And they're not quite sure about the, the timeline of exploitation yet. And cobalt crust is similar to polymetallic sulfides, that is broken into blocks. And um, you can see it's interesting, because they occur on seamounts, the contract areas kind of follow that environment. Um, so there's 150 blocks per contract for cobalt crust, and each block is 20 square kilometers. And it has a similar temporal flow, so um, with less overall area than the other contracts. So there's 3,000 square kilometers um, given uh, as the reserved area for a developing state. And over time, over 15 years, that's explored, and part of that is relinquished. Um, and eventually 1,200 square kilometers will actually be mined for cobalt crust. And again, that uh, timeline for exploitation is still being developed. So those spatial regulations are really what drives our geodatabase design. Um, so I've been talking about the top table there, the contract areas. So that's a feature class um, in our geodatabase, and that's related to all of these other tables. So we have a sample table and our, that's connected to our biology and geochemistry table, all of that environmental and mineralogy data. Um, and that is also our table catalog is where our metadata is, and, our, and we're, we'll be able to query and search on those um, specific metadata records. So every data set submitted by contractors will have metadata. Um, there's a lot of reports and maps that are unstructured um, being put into our database. So um, we're going to use Esri GeoPortal to manage all of that metadata. So that's going to be a really handy tool for us. Um, and then the, in that table catalog that I showed you, that's where all the metadata records will live. And they'll have a searching capability on the website for all of that data. And this is our general application architecture. So there's a lot going on here, and I won't uh, spend time to explain everything, but you, we're using Microsoft SQL Server as our central data repository, or geodatabase in the middle there. And that's connected to Esri Arc Server. And we're integrating ArcGIS online services, um, Esri JavaScript API, and all of those handy tools into our user interface. And then the Esri Geo Portal um, on the right side there, that's where um, all of our metadata lives. So our website design is really driven by different user personas. So there's this public and confidential data um, structure. So the public will be able to um, visualize, query, and download only environmental data. And the contractors, the people that are collecting and uploading the data, will be able to upload the data to the website, visualize, query, and download only their data. They can't look at other contract data. And then the ISA and the Legal Technical Commission will be able to look at all of the data um, to query, analyze, and download. So we're still in development uh, for our web application, but this is kind of a, uh, what it will look like. Uh, some things will change, but we have example contract areas here. We're going to have an interactive map interface. And then it'll all be, um, all this data will be coming from our geo database. So we'll be able to toggle layers on and off. And we have a legend, a search, and a library tab um, where you can make more specific queries and download data there. So the next steps um, complete the application and populate our geo database with historical information. And we're looking at how we can integrate the ecological marine, um, marine units into our web application so the ISA can look at those environmental factors um, with those minerals. And also, um, we think it'd be interesting to put this data on the living atlas eventually, too. 
Um, and so also ISA is still developing regula regulations for exploitation. You can actually look at draft regulations right now on their website. So I've given you a lot of information to digest today, but overall, overall our application will support the International Seabed Authority in making those spatially based decisions to serve their mission of providing equitable economic opportunities and to protect marine environments for future generations. Thank you.